Hello and welcome to the highlights from this week on The Politics Hub. I spent most of the week in Manchester at Conservative Party Conference. And you know what? You can learn an awful lot about the state of a party by their conference. And I know what you're expecting me to say. After 13 years of power, the Conservative Party is tired with half the MPs showing up. But that wasn't actually true. It was actually fizzing with ideas. Some events were packed out with standing room only. There's just one problem. It was all happening in the fringes, with a prime minister plagued by backseat drivers. I had an explore in search of the different Tory tribes. There are three tribes with three key issues who are battling for control of the Conservative Party. This is a kind of fringe event that is packed today, and you can see who's speaking there. Priti Patel, former Home Secretary, ally of Boris Johnson, someone very involved in the battle for the future of the Conservative Party. Yep. Perhaps the most pressing issue with the largest tribe here at Conservative Conference is taxes. And the debate is really about not whether or not they should be cut, but when. Before the election or after the election, it's a really live debate here. Look how busy it is in here. I can hardly get in the room. This is a fringe on immigration. It's got speakers like the MP Jacob Rees-Mogg, a key issue for many people who are looking to the future of what the Conservative Party should be about. Three tribes, three issues, one big problem for the Prime Minister. Because it strikes me that the debate here at Conservative Party conference isn't even about what happens at this general election, it's what happens after it. On Monday, I spoke to the Energy, Security and Net Zero Secretary, Claire Catino. She's been touted as a potential future leader after getting promoted by Rishi Sunak over the summer. It was her first big TV interview since then. But I never expected the conversation to be dominated by the question of whether or not Labour were really proposing a tax on meat. Um, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, gave a speech today where it felt to me like he was almost signalling the return back to austerity in some ways, hiring freeze in the civil service, squeeze on benefits. At the very same time, Liz Truss is pitching a totally different economic vision, one of growth, one of tax cuts. Who's right? So I wouldn't say that at all. I reject that there was a return to Australia. What he actually talked about was raising the national living wage. It's going to be now, I think, if not the highest, one of the highest national living wages anywhere in Europe. And actually, if you look at something like benefits, we raised them in line with inflation about 10% this year. And throughout the course of the last few years, when people have struggled, whether it's with furlough or helping them through the energy crisis with £40 billion of support, we have supported vulnerable people at a, at a you know, high cost to the, to the rest of the um, taxpayers to make sure that we can really support vulnerable people through these difficult times. I want to ask you about Liz Truss as well. Is she being helpful? Well, look, I think Conservative Party, one of the things I love about it is that it is always a broad church and we feel very comfortable in having debates about things. So I haven't followed all of her comments, but I do think it's good um, that she stands up and, and talks about her views. I think it's good that everyone in the party feels that they can do that. I mean... The place was rammed. There was queues snaking around the corridor. There was over 200 people in the room, it felt like. Is the Conservative Party preparing to go back to the future of Liz Truss? <laughs> I'm very happy with the current Prime Minister, but I think everyone is as well. But look, I think the really important thing is that we have our debates here, we talk about different ideas, and what you're going to see from the Prime Minister is his long-term vision to make sure that we've got plans in the longer term for the future, and I think that's what you'll be seeing from us. I mean, there's a serious point here, though, because it feels like you're losing control of the narrative a bit. You've got Liz Truss pitching an alternative economic vision, you've got the HS2 announcement effectively leaking out. I mean, what's going on? Well, look, I think party conferences, as you'll know, because you'll have been to a town, I've been to a town, always it's have... last year, I <laughs> oh, They always have moments like this. We're here to have a debate, we're here to talk about fresh ideas, and I think the really important thing is that you'll see from the government, from the Prime Minister, ideas which will be talking about the longer-term security of the country. That's what you saw from me today in terms of the energy sector. I was talking about things like nuclear, pushing forward on things like small modular reactors, which are all the things which are in the best interest for the long term in the country. Yeah, you've suddenly, with your brief, it feels, being propelled right to the front of the Conservatives' election pitch. Uh, a lot of it is about being on the side of drivers. I mean, are you a motorist yourself? What car do you drive? I am. I have a second-hand Ford Fiesta. I wouldn't say I'm the world's best driver. I'm quite a cautious driver, but I do, yeah, I do have a, 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 a car that I do drive. And, you, so, and do you think that the embracement, I guess, of the kind of driving agenda is, is not at odds with net zero? No, 
not at all, not at all. This is the thing. I think, A, lots of people need their cars to get around. Like, I have a semi-rural constituency. And for lots of people, there's no other way to get around. I think it's really important that we support drivers. But if you look at what's happening with Net Zero, we have some of the most ambitious targets in the world. We've decarbonized faster than any other major economy. And we're not moving away. We're not moving away from those targets. We're just trying to make sure that the burden doesn't fall on struggling households. It sounds a bit have cake, eat cake, though. You're saying, yeah, it's fine, we're going to get to net zero. But guess what? You don't have to make any sacrifices. It's just going to happen magically. That's absolutely not the case. I mean, A, it hasn't been happening magically. We have been working really hard for the last 13 years, for example, to clean up our power system. So when we came into power, 7% of our um, power came from uh, renewables. And it's now well over 40%. I think in Q1 this year, it was 48%. That takes hard work. We've got the first, second, third, fourth largest offshore wind farms anywhere in the world in this country, all built under our conservative, uh, relative conservative government. But we're going to have the fifth one too soon. So all of this stuff does take hard work, but I think you can do this in a sensible way. We can meet those targets, but also protect families. Um, I just want to read a bit of your speech to you, because there was some one section of it that really struck me. You said, it's no wonder Labour seems so relaxed about taxing meat. Sir Keir Starmer doesn't eat it, and Ed Miliband is clearly scarred by his encounter with a bacon sandwich. Did you write, you didn't write that, did you? I did actually write that. I think, you know, it's good to have a, a, a light moment in your speech as well. But the point is actually... they proposing a neat task. The point is actually very serious. So some of the things that Labour are proposing are incredibly hard for working families. What's so whether you, have, whether you have things What's like... tax? That's what you're saying here. Well, so the point is... They are proposing things which are pushing families too hard. So you've got things like the ULES tax That's not expansion, tax. which does cost families £12.50 a day. It's not meat tax, though, is it? But that is very difficult. And they've got things like proposing that you would decarbonise the electricity grid by 2030 again, which would result in very difficult choices also for families. Not meat tax. And their plans to push up inflation by borrowing £28 billion. So the point that I was making is quite serious. Yes, that was a light hearted moment in the speech. But the point is actually deadly serious that if you push people too far in this country, country, you will lose the cause of climate change, something that I'm passionate about because I think it's really important that we get there. But genuinely, what? there isn't a meat tax. Well, actually, if you try and push too hard, what you do end up with is people, and by the way, this has been part of the debate, talking about discouraging people from eating meat. Now, as someone who's worked in government for some time, I can tell you when people, no tell, people, under Keir when people tell you that they want to you discourage people from eating meat, what they mean Where do is Where does say that? So when they talk about moving at the pace that they're moving, what they're, what they're implying is that difficult choices will have to be made. And we know from having carefully safeguarded this debate that when people talk about trying to do things faster and quicker, they do talk about things like discouraging people um, from eating meat and Keir changing Starmer's, their dietary requirements. Keir Starmer's that talked about people eating less meat, has well, he? Well, I mean, Keir Starmer doesn't ever tell people exactly what he thinks, which is part of the problem. And what we have tried to do is set out a really clear agenda on net zero so people know where we stand, which is making so that we can get to these ambitious targets, but also protecting families. Now, your face was in a Sunday Times article. Headlined, the Tory women who want to be leader. Claire Catino, recently elevated to the Cabinet as Energy Secretary, has barely any Cabinet experience, but she's formidably intelligent and allies speak highly of her political nous. She's likely to emerge as the face of the continuity Sunak calls, likely to emerge as a leadership candidate. That's a meteoric rise. No, I don't think so. Look, I've only been in my job six weeks. I am very busy as it is. I've got two, I think, some of the most important briefs that we've got in the country, energy security and net zero, and I'm very passionate about delivering both. At the same time, though, you can see it going on around us, the jostling, the position, the different speeches by different wings of the party. Are you, would you, you know, be a bit tempted at a tilt yourself at some point? No, look, like I said, I'm very busy with the current position. OK. It feels a little bit like you're kind of taking that time-honoured role as the leadership candidate that the papers talk about, who seems to have sort of come from nowhere, if you like. So can you just t give us a bit of a sense? This is, I feel this is your first kind of big interview since getting the big elevation. So give us a sense of yourself. Well, I think people might not know about you. I would say the reason that I am so honoured and privileged to do this role is it actually covers a lot of the things that I've been interested in in my whole career. So one is investment and economy. The second is struggling households, something that I've done 
work with since I was about 16, and the third is the environment. And I think actually this brief brings all of those three things together, and that's exactly what I'm going to be focused on delivering for the country. What's your position when it comes to taxes? Michael Gove told my colleague Trevor, Trevor Phillips yesterday that he wants to see tax cuts before the election. Do you? Well, look, we all want to see tax cuts. We're conservatives. That is part of our philosophy. I think the really important thing at the moment is inflation. So if you look at what the Conservatives have done over our last period, is we've taken quite a lot of people, particularly at the bottom of society, out of tax. But something which affects everybody, particularly those people who are in those kind of lowest deciles, is inflation. So it doesn't sound to me like tax cuts before the election is what you're at. I would say I think the priority has to be tackling inflation because not only does it make the poorest in society poorer, it also affects public services, it also affects businesses. Do you that think that the are, are tax cuts inflationary? Uh, I would love to see tax cuts, but I think the priority economically has to be to tackle inflation. And actually, we've seen it move a long way. So if you think about the beginning of the year, it was 11%. It's now coming down. It's forecast to fall further next year. But that, to me, has to be the priority. Well, on Tuesday, I spoke to Michelle Donnellan, the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology. She wasn't giving anything away on the imminent axing of HS2. So instead, I asked her about the language used about immigration by the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, in her conference speech. Suella Braverman, uh, speech today, Home Secretary, she warned of a hurricane of mass migration. I mean, she's previously talked to, talked to swarms of people. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with that language? I think that um, every time I knock on a door in my constituency, very, very often, this topic of uh, illegal immigration is coming up. It's one of the top priorities of the British public. I'm not in a red wall seat, and yet it's coming up again and again because people how are saying that they want it dealt with. It's not fair. And I think fairness is in our DNA, isn't it? Uh, we are happy to help those who desperately need help. Absolutely. But we shouldn't be happy to help those that try and cheat and abuse the system. At the same time, though, and look, I, I accept, you know, mm. there's a debate about mass migration. that We're seeing people moving around the world uh, in ways that we haven't before. But I'm talking about the language specifically. Some would say it's quite dehumanising. It, it's almost scaremongering. I, I don't think that's true. I mean, it's not scaremongering. It is a fact that uh, there is um, a, a great deal of people every year and it has been on the increase. Obviously, we've got it down by 20% this year, but before that, it was increasing, that are cheating the system, trying to get into the country. Uh, after being in a safe country, often these people are actually economic migrants. They're not genuine, genuinely in need when there are other people that are genuinely in need. And what I always think is that every place that is taken up by somebody that doesn't need it is at the expense of somebody who does need it. Um, I have to say, you know, listening to the Swella Braverman speech, the, the hall loved it. She got a huge standing ovation. Her speaking style, it seems to me, has dramatically improved. I mean, it sounded an awful lot like a leadership pitch. Beth was just saying, you know, she's not taking aim at the Shadow Home Secretary, she's going for Keir Starmer. Well, look, I spoke about Keir Starmer in my speech. I think practically every cabinet minister spoke about Keir Starmer in their speech, uh, as well as our own agenda and our, our own policy. She is, it's, it's, she's pitch rolling though, right? Come on, you know it, I know it, everyone knows it. No, what I know is that we've got a very competent Prime Minister who is delivering and delivering on the things that are coming up, certainly on the doorsteps in my constituency and the, the topics that have been raised here in this conference. Is it useful and there's for no a very vacancy. competent Prime Minister when there's no vacancy for people to be effectively pitch rolling for leadership? I'm not convinced she's doing that. You know, she's Home Secretary, she's made a powerful speech on immigration. That is her job, and that is what you would expect her to do. Um, Rishi Sunak told um, Beth Rigby that nobody wants a general election now. Do you think that's right? Yeah, definitely. We've uh, got a lot to deal with. What, what people want is they want uh, support throughout the cost of living crisis. That's what we've been delivering. They want us to tackle things like immigration. They want us to tackle things like um, cutting uh, inflation. That's exactly what we're on track to do. A election, as we all know, would be a massive distraction from that. It would stop the government from delivering and getting on and supporting people. Um, my other sort of thought is, after spending like a few days at the Conservative conference, it feels like there is a battle for the, the soul of the party going on. You know, we've got Suella Braverman, you've got Nigel Farage doing karaoke <laughs> with Pretty Patel. I'm afraid I miss that. I'm a bit disappointed I miss that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're going to, we'll, show, don't worry, we'll show a bit of it okay. later. It's quite exciting. Um, do you accept that the Conservative Party has shifted to the right? 
No, we've always been a broad church, always. That is the very nature of our party and that's why um, we're effective, we're effective in, in government because we look at things from different perspectives it feels to me and we work together. There has been a shift to the right though. If you look at the, the language you know, in the speech today on, on migration, on, on other policies as well, and then you also see someone like Nigel Farage, you know, boogieing on down with the kind of <laughs> former Home Secretary. Well, well let's be clear, Nigel Farage is not a member of the Conservative Party. He is here at the conference, but he's not a member of the Conservative Party. So I think we, we should be clear on that. We're a broad church. We've always been a broad church. I dispute the fact that we're shifting in any way to the right. I think what we're showing is we're showing common sense policies, policies that people want, just like we did on the Green Agenda the other day. We're, we're listening to people and we're in touch with what they're asking us to do when we're actually delivering. OK, and just finally, can I ask like a really stupid question? You did your speech at conference today and you spoke about the slow creep of wokeism. Mm. What, what is wokeism? I, mean, I think that's a good question. So my definition, and this isn't probably the same as everybody's, but I think of it in two, two buckets, if you like. So the first bucket is the denial that facts are facts and that this claim that facts are open to interpretation, which was what I was saying we're trying to deal with because I'm the Minister for Science and I believe that a Conservative government should be standing up for facts and scientific integrity and rigour. And then the second bucket is this almost a movement where people believe that their values and their opinions are above everybody else's and that they can uh, enforce them and silence out other people's views. And that's something that I tried to deal with when I was higher education minister with the Freedom of Speech Act. OK, um, really interesting to talk. Thank you very much for coming on Thank the programme uh, today, Michelle donnellan Fair. Well, Conservative Conference may have felt slightly chaotic at times, with HS2 constantly threatening to derail the narrative. But one theme did stand out. The party is keen to wage a war on woke. Here are the best bits. The British people will get to decide if they want to curb woke with Rishi Sunak or let it run riot with Keir Take the Knee Starmer. Wake me up. Imagine, imagine what would happen if he became Prime Minister. Britain would go properly woke. Changing our approach to equality and diversity initiatives. Not a box to be ticked by hiring a diversity manager. As Conservatives, we know what a woman is. To deliver the long-term change the NHS needs, we need a relentless focus on patient outcomes. It does not mean spending huge sums of taxpayers' money on diversity consultants. We stand with the many against the few, the privileged woke minority. Tonight's the last night of conference, and that means closing parties, but don't get too excited. The vibe is definitely less Ibiza and more drunk uncle at a wedding, and ever keen to hear the sounds of their own voices. Politicians love karaoke. Now, last year's karaoke was cancelled, but this year it's back with a vengeance because Pretty Patel has already burst into song with Nigel Farage. No, really. So we thought we'd bring you some of the best or maybe the worst sing-along moments. I really am not sure what to say <laughs> after watching that. It feels as if this um, kind of started in an age where there weren't camera phones and now there are and everyone's still just going around as if they didn't exist. 
Yes, well, I'm very pleased that camera phones did not exist when I started out going to party conference uh, quite a long time uh, ago. So, but Therese um, is legendary for her karaoke mm. in Westminster. I think all of us are probably yes. invited at one point or another to one of her karaoke parties. And, and I think you're right in a way. It's, a, it, it's the last night. Most of the, the, the ministers will have done their speeches. Um, and so there is just a sense of it's a big thing preparing for a speech. Mm. Uh, lots of, you say, weeks of preparation clearance. And so I think people do want to let, let their hair down. Are you going to be letting your hair down tonight? <laughs> 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 no, I'd love to be able to. And that would be a dream. But, um, no, I think, it, uh, as Nikki said, it's like politics is a high-pressure business. Mm. And, at the, you know, you go through the yeah. first couple of days, you're nervous about everything. You're kind of worried how things are going to land. Is it all going to get done? You know, yeah. you've got, if you're a special advisor, you've got your boss's speech to worry about. And there is that feeling on a Tuesday evening, you, yeah. you'll go out tonight... And you know that it's only the PM's team yep. then who are all stressed. Yeah. They might they might pop into a couple of the parties this evening, but you can finally like relax, yep. knowing that hopefully you touch wood, you've done a job, job exactly. done well. So Therese Coffey then, legendary karaoke singer. Have you been tempted by yourself or? I've been to one of the parties. Uh, I yeah. have no idea. I'm very pleased that there wasn't a video of me up there. Um, so, uh, but no, I mean they are they're they're, uh, they're a great thing and uh, yeah. And Michael Gove as well. Hitting the dance floor. Michael loves to dance. Mm. I think we've all seen yes. that. Yeah, great. I'm not sure. I, don't, I won't pass comment on the quality of his dancing, but <laughs> I think we can see he thoroughly enjoys it. Yeah, you can definitely see that. You can definitely see that. Um, and it's this kind of weird um, thing at conference where everyone is, like you say, away from the kind of normal reality. Mm. It does feel like a bit kind of fresh as week. There's often criticism, isn't there? Like, if you see someone like Pretty Patel and Nigel yeah. Farage, that's, that's kind of blown up into a bit of a, a mm. sort of social media storm. Um, do you think politicians should be a bit more careful, or do you think that actually it's unfair? Well, I think most people are very careful, um, mm. and, uh, and someone like that uh, obviously gets, uh, gets captured. Um, and you're right, I think in the pressure cooker of a party conference, these uh, things get magnified, don't they? Mm. And with social media, of course, it can all go viral and everything else. I don't think Pretty's going to be unhappy with that. No. Oh, really? That's interesting. You don't think so? Do you think... What do you think? You know Pretty, obviously. I think it's good. I think, it, look, politicians are human like everyone yeah. else. People forget that. And, um, as you said, look, in a social media age, you're not going to avoid this mm. stuff. And I think, you know, they, as, as much as anyone else, they want to go out, let their hair down, have a good time. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it shows them a different light. A reminder that the Politics Hub keeps going all day, every day, on the Sky News website and app. And if you scan the QR code, you can catch up with all the latest from Westminster and beyond. And we're back on your screens every Monday to Thursday night at 7pm. See you then.